Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me is Tim Dowling, an American journalist for The Guardian. He writes a weekly column for the newspaper's Weekend Magazine. He lives with his wife and three sons in London, and the book we'll be talking about with Mr. Dowling is How to Be a Husband. Uh, it's not a how-to book, but it's a very interesting <laughs> read, and uh, we won't get much self-help out of it. My girlfriend was excited when she heard the title, but... Uh, The content's not going to make her all that happy. Uh, No. I I really enjoyed this read. Uh, The first two chapters got me a little depressed because I already hold that marriage is the end of happiness, and it sounded like your your marriage got off to a a, a challenging start. Yeah. Marriage is sort of the beginning of happiness for me. Well, great. Um, the, the, The fact that you met this lady from London while you still live in Connecticut, and she was only there was only there for two weeks... And you were just determined to make her your girlfriend, despite the fact that you had one. I found that interesting. Yeah, I did. I already had a girlfriend, not for, you know, just, what, four years. <laughs> um, and also, you know, that wasn't the only problem in my way. I mean, apart from the fact that we were separated by an ocean, um, the English girl did not appear to like me at all. <laughs> so I had a lot of work to do in two weeks. Yeah. Um, but I... I did it all, and I ended up following her back to London. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I never really left. <laughs> I, I I find it interesting uh, being in a being an, an American, born and raised in America, that you've um, that you use the English vocabulary so well. I mean, you, you refer, refer to an elevator as a lift, and you refer to the bathroom as a loo, and you even refer to yourself as a git, and all of that. So, <laughs> how, how did you uh, become so indoctrinated? Well, I'm surrounded by English people. It's it's funny because I know a lot of Americans here who've been here as long as I have, and they haven't their accent hasn't changed, and they they are pretty committed to American idioms and expressing themselves in a very American style fashion. And I used to hate people like me who lost their accents and, and <laughs> sort of went native. And mm-hmm. I've had to change my thinking on that because I literally can't help it. I, I'm not doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in terms of doing it in the book, I think it was just like uh, the, the there was just we had to make a decision about how much the UK edition would be changed for the US edition, mm-hmm. and so and a surprising number of things actually have been changed. You probably wouldn't notice, but uh, we did decide. You know, things like Lyft. I guess they decided it it worked better the old way. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I do want to mention, uh, as you acquired this girlfriend in a fortnight, uh, <laughs> that as you broke up with your previous girlfriend to start this relationship uh a little bit of the cad side shows up there because you're breaking up with her and she's still crying but you have to hurry the waiter for the check because you have a date with your prospective yeah. girlfriend yeah i mean i still think of that as the worst thing i've ever done I <laughs> and then uh um, and it was quite painful to write about you know i thought do i want people to know this about me <laughs> And then, and then getting married. I, I, I like your uh, whimsical approach to that. I mean, why would you is a good question to ask. I think. Yeah, a lot of people. Are, a lot of people do ask it and don't get married. You know, it's uh, it's the number of people who who don't get married now is sort of is, has doubled or something in the in, in the UK in the last fifteen twenty years. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I needed. I had a reason. I needed some paperwork pronto. And you had a uh, a rather uh, interesting recount of your your honeymoon. Not all that romantic, yeah. <laughs> or was it? <laughs> no, it was it was our first. I think you know because when you when you're from different countries, uh, it falls to one person to sort of be the kind of person in charge in the in their country of origin. So when I didn't understand how anything worked in London, I couldn't work a bank machine or anything. You know, when you first, I didn't know how to do anything. So. My wife was taking the lead, and she did all the driving and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then when you go on, we went to Naples on our honeymoon, uh, and neither of us were sort of in charge, and we just we ran out of money. We, we, we were completely profligate and irresponsible and never kept track of anything, and it was a disaster. Mm-hmm. We went back very recently and for our sort of second honeymoon to the same place with more money. <laughs> it, was, it was great, actually. Um, because I, I identify so well with this, I want to talk a little bit about the chapter about how to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> you talk about arguments, which are inevitable in a marriage, I guess. And uh, I like the fact that some trivial domestic dispute, a failure to do something on your part, quickly escalates into a frank exploration of your inadequacies. Mm. 
and then I will always say, okay, this, is, this isn't about the ladder anymore. This isn't about the light bulb. <laughs> right. This is about the way people talk to each other. And then I, I turn it into a whole sort of moral thing, which is a, a huge mistake. Is that you never, in a marriage, a moral victory is something you always end up celebrating all by yourself. Indeed. <laughs> um, so you have to learn to be wrong, mm-hmm. really. And there are seven ways in which you might be wrong. The wrongness of omission. Yeah. <laughs> This is like a quiz. Uh-huh. I'll probably be able to remember three of them. The wrongness of omission. The wrongness of omission. Yeah, that's when you sort of leave something out. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It would, would, would hurt your case. Mm-hmm. The wrongness of not listening. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know how that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's the wrongness of making it all about you, mm-hmm. which is, I rarely have an argument with my wife where at some point she doesn't say, it has to be all about you. <laughs> If, and you just think, yeah, how do I answer that? And the next thing I'm going to say is going to, by the very nature of this discussion, be all about me. Mm-hmm. If you say, no, it's not all about me, that's all about you. Mm-hmm. And the wrongness, of, uh, the wrongness of forgetting your original purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that happens. I don't know if that happens to women as much as it happens to men, but I just get very confused mm-hmm. when I'm arguing on the fly. I don't, you know, I, I back myself into logical corners. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wrongness of underestimating your partner's emotional involvement in the issue. That one sa- sounds a bit dicey. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, it's true. It's not really true. When you say, oh, so I sudden, it's when you stop an argument, you say, I suddenly realize how strong you feel about this. When, when you, what you really mean is, um, I just realized that I don't feel strongly about this at all. <laughs> and the wrongness of alter- offering an ultimatum. Oh, this is good advice for someone who's never been a husband. <laughs> don't offer ultimatums, yeah. right? No, I've been, <laughs> I've offered many, and it's, it's, it always leaves you a hostage to fortune. I've done that thing where you jump out of a car because you can't possibly share that space with someone who uh, doesn't, won't treat you with dignity. And my wife will speed off before the door's even shut. I remember uh, later we'll in the book back. your account of one of those, and she's not the kind of person who rolls down the window and drives slowly along <laughs> begging you to get back in. <laughs> no, nor will she ring me up later to find out how I'm coping with my choices. <laughs> how about the uh, the comparison of being a good husband in 1950 versus being a relevant husband in 2014? Because there is the question of whether or not men are relevant in one chapter here. Yeah, I think that's that sort of the idea that we've come to the end of men is uh, is, is certainly prevalent, whether it's true or not. But I, there, there's very little that you could, uh, discri- relevance-wise, you have to sort of make your own way in the world now. You can't rely on your gender to give you rev- relevance anymore. And I think, you know, in the, in the old days, if you went out for cigarettes and you came back, everybody thought you were a great husband. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 there's a there's a two column comparison. We won't we won't quiz you again, but I really like the uh, <laughs> every time you go out for cigarettes, you come back in 1950, and in 2014, every time you're sent out for espresso pods and tampons, you come back with the right sort. And I think that's yeah, a pretty that's critical comparison. <laughs> it's much harder now. <laughs> um, uh, you, I wondered about this because I, I, I feel it, uh, even though I, I've studied human communication, um, mm-hmm. modern masculinity is a, a patchwork of disparate talent, specialist knowledge, non-lateral thinking, and a handy lack of people skills. How does that all work <laughs> <Yeah>. together? <laughs> I haven't got any. Uh, I think, yeah, it's that sort of thing. It's a sort of weird, you have to turn those kind of traditional male vices into virtue somehow if you're going to sell yourself as a man in the world. And one of them is that sort of monotasking. You know, women are good at multitasking, but if you need a man to sort of sit for three hours and gouge all the wax out of an old candlestick, he's your man. He'll do it. There you go. That's the difference in the focus. exclusion of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, agreeing about the curtains is another one, of course, that makes you relevant. Yes, this is my defin- This is my specialty. Sometimes you want one of those people who will really talk to you about the curtains, who will say, I think they're a bit heavy for summer, or I like the pattern, but maybe the pinch pleats are too much. Or, you know. <laughs> but if you want someone who goes, yeah, fine, whatever, and walks away, that's me. <laughs> I can help you there. And you've served as a human pocket as well. <laughs> mm. it's, when does, I mean, it's kind of, I guess women have stopped carrying really big bags. Maybe it's just my wife, but when they go out, they... Um, they don't, they don't bring the means to carry anything on their person, but they still bring the stuff they want to carry. And over the course of the evening, I'm just sort of handed it. Mm-hmm. Can you carry my phone? Can you carry my book? Can you carry my glasses? Can you carry my other glasses? Mm-hmm. And luckily, you know, I'm, I'm all pockets. Mm-hmm. I got <laughs> Well, now, I, I, I like the 12 labors of marriage. You had an interesting situation as a freelance writer where you were home most of the time. 
And so there were yeah. certain chores that uh, that you were more inclined to do, um, uh, such as uh, uh, in terms of housework. Um, it's not something you love to do. It's not something you're trained to do. No, it's not. And I, I think in a weird way, no, my, no, it was my wife. My wife is not a particular sort of housekeeper, and it means that if if that means one thing, it means that um, she will not allow me to sit back and do absolutely nothing although if i were to ask her now she would say he does absolutely nothing <laughs> um it doesn't feel like i'm doing nothing mm-hmm. what can i say yeah. but it's funny when you're home all day you you have that you have that sort of 50s housewife setup basically you're the person who takes packages in for the neighbors and when when what my wife calls tradespersons come to the door to, to fix the boiler and stuff mm-hmm. i'm the one who has to deal with all that mm-hmm and the man, the wet fish seller from Newcastle, who drives down overnight and asks you if you want any place and trout. <laughs> I like no, the, the not today, madam. <laughs> <laughs> I like that the social circle is composed of fish sellers from Newcastle and, and postmen with packages and Jehovah's Witness and muggers yeah. holding clipboards for form criminals selling <laughs> dust cloths. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting collection yeah. of people. And I, because I don't, I don't want. Nobody wants to win their freelance. Nobody wants to work. I have time to chat. Usually, you know, I'm the only person who can talk down a Jehovah's Witness that I know. <laughs> they usually, they're like, "Okay, we've got a lot of houses to see." I'm like, "No, come in." No, we're really, we've got to go. <laughs> uh, and and neither one of you are particularly uh, inclined to cook, although you have some interesting recipes called Mexican <laughs> and spicy yeah, ricey. It's just called Mexican. <laughs> I invented it. I sort of, I got a sort of hankering for sort of Tex Mexican food, and there was virtually no such thing in this country at that time. And I just sort of threw together something, and uh, and it's become one of those recipes that you sort of have every Monday. Mm-hmm. And it, it's I couldn't if you if you said is it enchiladas, if you said is it burritos, I'd say no, it's none of this. It's Mexican. <laughs> the one thing about it is it's not remotely Mexican. Mm-hmm. And then of course there's spicy ricey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spicy ricey is. One of those, my children sort of think of it as a punishment, even though that's not why we invented it. It's just that thing where you tip everything that's in the fridge that you happen to have into a pot with mm-hmm. some rice, mm-hmm. and then you put the lid on for a while, see what happens. And one of your one of your roles is, is shutting down the house at night, and uh, your, your wife goes through the checklist with you. <laughs> yeah, I never, I've never understood why, if, if I'm in charge of it, why I have to sort of answer all the questions like, did you turn this off? Did you turn? Did you lock the back door? Did you let the dog have a pee? Mm-hmm. Like, yes. And, I do these things every night. And and you lie about the children being asleep, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, I'll never go to bed if I have to wait for them to be actually asleep. You also uh, have a, a sort of interesting approach to do it yourself, uh, in terms of the roles of men and uh, and how you go about it and what what you are willing to risk being yeah. skilled at. <laughs> it's it's funny how I it's I it's not one of my things DIY, uh, but I find it tremendously empowering, and I just re- I suddenly realized that that uh, if you're willing to have a go. Uh, it's, there's only so much damage you can do to your house. <laughs> I even now, for a long time, I wouldn't touch electricity because it's a whole different system here. And uh, now I'm, I'm happy to rewire lamps, everything. I've been, you know, shocked off a ladder a number of times, <laughs> and it holds no fear for me now. Mm-hmm. And I, I like the, the recommendation that you never ask yourself, "Will I make it worse?" You can't make it worse. You can only move it forward <laughs> to where a professional intervention becomes advisable. <laughs> yes. I, I call that progress. Indeed. <laughs> um, so the the whole thrust of this about how to be a good husband involves finding a, a, a place where you can uh, reign without getting too much grief for what you don't do well. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. I'm going to have to correct you slightly because it's not called how to be a good husband. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's called how to be a husband. <laughs> the good was the first thing to go. <laughs> Um, five things you can actually fix by hitting him with a hammer. Central yes. <laughs> central <laughs> heat <Sometimes>. heating pump. <laughs> yes, I have tried that. Sometimes, apparently, there's like a bit of gunk in the system, and it just freezes the blade of the fan that drives the pump. And if you give it a thwack with a nice lump hammer, mm-hmm. you can sometimes it'll sometimes start it. 
uh, and I once I once did it, and it didn't work. And I called the plumber, and he came around and he hit it with a slightly bigger hammer. <laughs> and I had to pay him forty pounds. <laughs> And the car starter, when you turn the key and nothing happens, it's often worth giving uh, giving the motor a tap. Yeah, have you ever tried that? I, I have. I think the idea, because <laughs> I, 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 I have a very vague idea of what happens inside a car starter, or even what a car starter looks like. Uh, the first time I tried it, uh, someone told me about it, and uh, I had to like look up car starter and on Google Images and download a picture of it and take it out to the car. Uh, and uh, I guess it's sort of sometimes the brushes get worn and they lose contact. And if you sort of give it a whack, it'll, it's enough to sort of get it to spring to life. And here's one I've oh, never. And it did. It, <laughs> it did work. <laughs> yeah. Well, see that that makes you a skilled mechanic at that point, I guess. And, yeah. Uh, a I, hero. I, 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 one I haven't done that you recommend for the hammer for is a virus plagued computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes care of business. Mm-hmm. It's a one way solution. Yeah. Um, extended family. Let's see. Uh, you, this this was the chapter of your life when you your mother in law and your wife started talking about sharing a home together. And that yeah, was, resulted it's in very, some um, And we did it in the end. It was a very uh, odd, old fashioned solution to a sort of problem. Um, my my mother in law had been ill, and and she, for various reasons, she wanted to be closer to London. So she sold her house in the country and. We sold our apartment, and we just, I, I thought this will never happen, because I thought for this, all this money, we're never going to find the kind of house they're talking about. And uh, they found one right around the corner that was sort of languishing on the market, and we moved in. Mm-hmm. And I just, I was slightly terrified by the whole prospect. It seems like a very grown-up thing to, for me to do at the time, but it, it worked out. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the recount of uh, uh, watching figure skating when, when your wife was out of town with your mother-in-law. <laughs> It is quite weird spending a lot of time with your mother-in-law when your wife isn't there. But she would still cook for me, you know, and she called me downstairs every night because we basically made a separate flat upstairs for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I would go down and eat with her, and it was the Winter Olympics. So the whole week my wife was away for work. We were watching the figure skating, and we got really involved in it. My wife came bursting through, and she said, what are you watching this for? Figure skating is stupid. And she was furious that we had this, you know, new hobby. <laughs> She and wife, said, her mother and I are going to a huge fight about it. That, that was when the, they held spaghetti over each other's heads, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they did. I left the room for a minute. When I came back, they were holding handfuls of spaghetti over each other's heads, threatening to let go. <laughs> well, some of that spaghetti was from my plate as well. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Um, the guiding principles of gross marital happiness. I want to, going to bed angry if you want to is, is an interesting change from the usual advice. Yes, well, people do say there's this notion that you uh, should a couple should never let the sun set on an argument, but I'm here to tell you that that's not going to work. <laughs> Some arguments are two-day affairs just by their very nature. And I think if you're, uh, you're faced with a choice between this whole idea of closure and a good night's sleep, you're better off with a good night's sleep in almost every case. Mm-hmm. Um, l- leaving the loose seat up or down is another one that... <laughs> give advice on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's... People have different weird abstruse arguments about that. I think the rule is just don't be on the seat. Mm -hmm. And if you've got sons, then you have to teach them that. Mm -hmm. Um, How about... Let's see. Some of these rules I've got underlined and exclamation points (laughs) beside them. (laughs) Um, There's no good rejoinder to the exclamation, I'm not your mother. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's true. But I can tell you from personal experience that then stop buying me ugly sweaters is really not a good one. It's not one to one. use, right? <laughs> um. I've tried it, so you don't have to. <laughs> and, and thanks for taking that risk for all of us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I took one for the team. <laughs> it's okay to steal small amounts of money from one another. Now, that's an interesting one to me as well. Uh, joint savings accounts yeah. and stuff. Well, no, I think it, you shouldn't really rob the savings account in, you know, in, in the night. But I think the idea that uh, there's, there's an idea where above, you know, below which you are simply, all your money is basically shared money, mm-hmm. as you say. And uh, uh, so $10, $10 here and there robbed out of someone's pocket is fine. And then, of course, it's fine up until you realize you have kids and you realize that that's where all your money is going. <laughs> I I, uh, I think this is really... Uh uh, wise. Never go out on Valentine's Day. Go out on the 13th instead. <laughs> Absolutely. Valentine's Day is 
amateur night. You're a married couple. You have an anniversary to celebrate and stuff. Valentine's Day isn't really, it's not even for you. It's for the people, you know, in the first flush of a very uncertain relationship and they're trying to cement things. Mm-hmm. And it's, I can't think of anything more depressing than being in a restaurant surrounded by couples. <laughs> Go out on the 13th and you'll have the restaurant to yourself. You know. And uh, that's not to say you can forget <laughs> Valentine's Day, right? If you're a man, you are not allowed to forget. Mm-hmm. Um, love is one of those emotions you occasionally have to talk yourself into. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. When you're having, you know, trouble, I think it's important to sort of sit back and think about all the things that you find charming and marvelous and lovely about your partner. But sometimes, I, I sometimes I think it's easier to do that when they're asleep. <laughs> and. Um, don't worry about having revealed yourself over time. Marriage is like sharing a basement with a fellow hostage. After five years, there are <laughs> few off-putting things you won't know about one another, and after ten years, there are none. <sighs> yeah, absolutely. It's just one of those things you have to get used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, the Department of Health currently recommends that men should drink no more than 21 units of alcohol per week and women 14. <laughs> yeah, that's a consumption ratio of approximately... Well, no, exactly, three to two. Mm-hmm. But you can't divide a bottle of wine according to those proportions if you're married. Mm-hmm. It's got to be half each. Well, since, since I have a, a binational marriage, I'm taking to heart some of these things. And a little, par- <laughs> <laughs> a, a little paranoia is a good thing in a marriage? Complacency is a more dangerous enemy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think security is a dangerous thing in a partnership, and you should never really kind of... Uh, get yourself into a state where you can't imagine the whole thing falling apart over a long weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a few sleepless nights a year worrying about your marriage falling apart, mm-hmm. probably not a bad thing. And it's never too late to not apologize? That's a, that's a good one, too, I think. It's never too late to apologize. What I mean by that is it's, it's uh, even when it's far too late to say sorry for saying sorry to do any good, you should still apologize. <laughs> you basically have to apologize and also apologize for apologizing too late. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that uh, you you uh, you spent a lot of time where your wife was working at the BBC, and uh, you were doing freelance, and so she was bringing home the bacon more than you at that point. Yeah, I think that was. I think these days that's a, that's a much more normal thing than it was mm-hmm. in those days. Um, it was. Uh, you know, it was pretty humiliating in those days. And I, I, you try to, at the time, you sort of, you think, oh, well, we have a liberal marriage and I'm not going to worry about this thing. But it really sort of, it really sort of eats away at your self-esteem over over a while. And uh, I, I remember getting a call in the middle of this, and I was just doing some kind of crappy data entry job. And, and I got a call from a big magazine, GQ, called me up and they said, we'd, we'd like you to write an article. And I thought, well, obviously someone is finally recognize my talents but i mean i had never i didn't i'd never written for them or i'd never sent them i, I couldn't understand why they were calling me mm-hmm. and i just said yeah fine how you know how long what what do you want and uh, they said we we want you to write an article called man enough to live off your girlfriend <laughs> and i suddenly realized they weren't calling me because they thought i was a journalist they were calling me because they were looking they, they said we need someone who lives off his girlfriend and someone somewhere said i know a guy just like that <laughs> but it was just literally the start of my career in journalism mm-hmm. and then uh, and and uh, it it sort of got accelerated because your wife uh, <laughs> occasionally mentioned she was yeah. pro- getting pregnant <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah you need to work more you need to bring more money home um but it's yeah that's it's just obviously you write a, an article about how to live off your girlfriend it's not it's not necessarily the glory the most glorious start to a journalist career it was quite a slow mm-hmm. uptake i suppose and uh, you wrote a very short chapter about sex. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I had to do all over again, I probably would have made it shorter. <laughs> My wife was furious with uh, the idea of it. Mm. But uh, it's, you can't really write about marriage without um, writing about sex because mm-hmm. your editor won't let you. <laughs> if you can't. Um, but it's basically, I mean, the one takeaway thing from that is really that uh, to me it was the, uh, the, the strategies of maintaining a healthy sex life are not in themselves at all sexy. It's got a lot more to do with emptying the dishwasher without being asked than, than anybody wants to tell you. Uh, I suspect that's so, but I also like if you can't do it without, with the cat watching, you're probably not as interested as you think you are. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. You've got to be committed. 
Uh-huh. But you've got to strive to have it regularly is, is one of your pieces of advice. And it seems to me that's difficult in the longer a marriage gets. Yeah, and, you know, I didn't make that up. This is, what, this is one of those things that lots of relationship experts advocate. Um, you have to forget all about passion, really, and uh, spontaneity and experimentation. Because I think, you know, that's true carnal open-mindedness. Mm-hmm. It means embracing the idea that run-of-the-mill sex is still worth, worth having. <laughs> people used to say, people used to have a joke, they used to say, sex, this is a really old joke, sex is like pizza. When it's good, it's great, and when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Yes. <laughs> But at some point, the words, even if you don't feel like it, escaped your lips. So that was probably... <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure I've tried that. <laughs> I'm not sure it works. You know, oh, let's I've, been, ta- I've been refused in a lot of different ways. <laughs> let's talk about uh, dealing with a pregnant wife a little bit then. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I've done that. What does it mean to be supportive? <laughs> Yeah, supportive is one of those things where I think what we're basically mean, we're saying suck it up, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Don't express any of your own needs or emotions. And, you know, in a weird way, you can you can boil a lot of, of what being supportive down into like just things you shouldn't say to a pregnant woman. You know, like I know what you mean. My back is killing me. Mm-hmm. You've got nine months where you just sort of clam up and do as you're told, and if you have to go looking for car seats at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, then that's what you have to do. <laughs> and just briefly, because we have a couple of minutes left, uh, talk about not being the alpha male. <laughs> yeah, I, we all talk about alpha males all the time. Like, this is, like, and we've all just agreed somehow that this is a thing. But, I, you know, alpha males are, that's chimps and wolves. And even wolves, they don't, they don't call wolves alpha males anymore because a uh, wolf pack isn't run by an alpha male. I mean, the, the head of a wolf pack is like the father. The wolf, a wolf pack is a family. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, this whole notion that we are all, um, we're all divided into alpha and beta. I mean, someone rang me up once and said, do you consider yourself an alpha, an alpha male or a beta male? And I said, I said, I think I come somewhere around cow. And they, <laughs> <laughs> they put the phone down. <laughs> They didn't really get it. They're like, I don't really understand the Greek alphabet. And I like the uh, qualities of the non-alpha status, being a vegetarian, not being able to drive, eating quiche, wearing glasses, displaying a chronic reluctance to commit assault, <laughs> allowing a woman to buy you yeah. dinner, <laughs> lots of great stuff, owning an apron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll cop to a few of those. <laughs> Probably not to owning an apron. I have, there is an apron that I know I, I can use. I have use of one. It's not mine. Well, uh, I uh, I had a laugh on every page except those first two chapters when I thought this isn't going to this isn't going to end well, but it does. Uh, there, there's there's clearly two decades of love and learning in here that uh, that I think people would enjoy very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it, and uh, for our guests, we've been talking with Tim Dowling. The book is How to Be a Husband. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening. If you don't get a chance to hear us on our regular broadcast four times a week, you can also catch us on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook.